2 Timothy, starting in verse 1, chapter 1. And I'm only going to touch on three verses in this chapter because I'm going to kind of talk about a couple of things. In verse 1, Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. I read this verse because it helps us to understand that it is the Lord that called us to be saved. Of all the things that you must understand, God shows you you did not choose God. So it has nothing to do with you being qualified. Like, you know, I'm just a bad person, or I'm saved because I'm good. No, none of, none of the above. Whether you're bad or good doesn't mean anything because none, none good in God. But God has chosen us because he loves us. And he desires you. He desires to have you be a part of him. And so he reaches out and he chooses people. And then what we do is we respond to the call of God. We respond to being drawn by God. And then we become a part of the kingdom of God. It's not something that we do. It's something that God does. That's why it's such a blessing to be saved. Especially in my situation. Because the people that I hung out with, all of us was druggies. All of us were messed up. All of us were ones, well, why did God choose me? Why did God say, you know, William, come out of the darkness, and then, then left them there? It wasn't because I was doing anything better than them or anything different or smarter or any of that. And so that's why I'm always so thankful, because God could have said, I'm not choosing you, I'm choosing you. Right. Like, oh my goodness, I would have been left behind. But the Lord chose me, he called me, he drew me, I felt him pulling on me, and I responded to it, and I went to the altar, and I was born again. Amen? Amen. So when you look at this, Paul understands this. Yes. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. How? By the will of God. Yes. Paul was a murderer. He was killing folks all the time. Every day. I was talking to a bishop two days ago. I said, you know, the funny thing, sometimes you can look at things in a weird way. Like, I, the Lord told me, you know, take the church online. And I remember talking to a lot of pastors saying, you know, it's time for us to take the church online. Well, why? We need people to come together. I said, well, we still come together, but we need to take the church online. That was literally the Lord talking to me and then using me to talk to the pastors. Then when the corona came, nobody could go to church. Everybody started scrambling. You can't even buy a, a, a streaming product. They're all sold out. Because the Lord said, okay, y'all don't want to listen? Let me just call something to happen that will force you to take this gospel online. The same thing he did when he died on Calvary. They got the Holy Ghost, day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. eight you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be a witness unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and to the othermost parts of the earth. What did they do? They just kept hanging out in Jerusalem. The Lord said, you're supposed to go everywhere. They're like, nah, we, we're chilling right here. It's cool. We know everybody's friends. We're to your house, your house, eating and stuff. And the Lord said, okay, they might get that. So he let Saul rise up and make havoc against the church, kicking down people's doors, dragging them out, throwing them in prison, stomping on them, killing them. And you would think, oh my God, why would God let that happen? Because he needed them to be scattered. And what did they do? They went scattered everywhere, preaching the gospel, and the gospel goes to Samaria, it goes all over the place because of how the Lord used Saul. Yeah. And so now you, can, you find preachers all over the internet preaching all kinds of stuff. Yeah. I'm like, good, thank you. Yeah. And so some things that look bad aren't really bad. They're really designed for the purpose of God. And so Paul understood that the only reason why he was able to do what God was calling him to do is because the Lord had called him. Yes. And he called him according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. He called him, said, listen, I'm going to give you life. I'm going to deliver you from this life of death. I'm going to give you eternal life. We have this life of death, of this, this life of life. We don't have a life of death anymore. We used to. Yes. We used to be lost in darkness. We used to be messed up. We were estranged uh, from the commonwealth of God. We didn't know the Lord, and we didn't have any hope. But then the Lord came along, and he drew us back unto himself, and he gave us a life, a life of peace and joy and tranquility and power and might and excitement. This is what God has for us. Hallelujah. And he did it for us on his own without us doing anything. Amen? Amen. Drop down to verse 8 and 9. I'm going to show you something else here. So then Paul goes on and he begins to talk to Timotheus, which is Timothy. He says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, 
but be thou partakers of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. He says, listen, you see me go through and struggle. You see me be afflicted. You see me uh, deal with hard times and because I'm preaching the gospel. He says, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't back down from people that are like, oh, I don't want to hear about that Christian stuff. Oh, I don't want to hear that. Say, listen, don't be ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Understand the power of that. The fact that Jesus went all the way to the cross <coughs> to pay for our sins. Don't run out because of cough. Right. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, man. So, he said, don't, don't be ashamed of the fact that when you're walking with God, sometimes you're going to be afflicted. People are going to resist you. People are not going to like you. People are going to talk about you. He said, but that's what the gospel is all about. It's about standing for the Lord and standing against the, uh, the grain of the world. The world hates God. Amen. And in Paul's day, every time Paul tried to preach, they tried to stone him, put him in prison. He didn't hardly say anything. He would chase them from city to city. He would be like on the run, like really on the run. We're barely on the run. Somebody might, you know, frown or something, and then we just get real quiet. He said, listen, don't be ashamed of the gospel, and don't be ashamed of me as a prisoner. He said, I did all this stuff for the furtherance of the gospel. I allowed myself to go to prison. I allowed myself to be stoned. I allowed myself to be beaten and chased because I understood how powerful and necessary the gospel is. And God is saying to us today, listen, don't let anything make you feel like you have to be quiet when it comes to the gospel. Yes. Like, well, I don't want anybody to know I'm a Christian. Listen, everybody should know it. You should shout it from the rooftops. Listen, I'm saved and I'm glad about it. Yes. And you should be able to use that power of the gospel to encourage them to come to God, knowing and understanding that when they come to God, their life will change and never be the same forever. Yes. There's a lot of power in the gospel. Paul tells the Romans, he says, the gospel is the power of God and the salvation for all of them that believe. There are some that don't believe, but everybody that makes a decision to believe, there is a power connected to the gospel that will sa save your soul. Because walking with God is about your soul being saved. It's not about money in your pocket. I love somebody. Now, God allows you to have the wisdom to know to do to make money. That's not an issue. We never preach, you know, you have to be poor to be saved. Right. I don't preach that. Because it doesn't matter to God. We, we saw that when the woman with the alabaster box, with the oil, anointed Jesus' feet. Right. Poured it on, on his feet, anointed his head, and one of the spiritual apostles said, man, we could have took this oil and used it to pay for the poor. Jesus said, you're going to always help poor people. The poor you will have always. Why, why would he even say something like that? Because he understands there's a lot of people ain't going to submit to God. Right. They're in their condition because of their rebellion against the power of God. When you live a life of rebellion, the end result is destruction. Yeah. It doesn't happen instantly. I didn't instantly become a drug addict when I was 19 and 20. But after, from 16 to 27 of doing cocaine and, and hash and, you know, grass and all kinds of stuff, mescaline and acid, all these things, it drove my life down to nothing. Right. And people get involved in things like drinking and alcohol. Yeah, when you're 22, you can drink and party, and your life is to go to work. But wait till you get 35. Oh, no. You keep drinking. Then you're sick. All of a sudden, you're losing. You're, you don't have no money. It, you're, it's a downward spiral of destruction, that the path that you're on. But when you come to God, God turns that thing around. So God already understands that when you serve him, you don't have to worry about things and stuff. All you do is seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So that's not really an issue. The most important part when walking with God is learning how to walk with God. Learn how to be in the battle and recognize that you are in a warfare. Because before that, you were on the devil's side, you didn't have to pay attention to it. Right. It's like Paul said in Romans, he says, sin doesn't become sinful until somebody tells you not to do it. I don't think nobody says nothing to you. Hey, it's fine and down. You're having a good time. But the moment somebody tells you you can't do that, then all of a sudden, you know, I'm going to do it anyway. Then there's this, there's this 
a resistance yeah. to the law that's telling you not to do this. You're trying to do it anyway. And that's what's happening in their life today. There are many, many people that God is speaking to them, trying to follow them, trying to cause them to, to live according to his will, but they're resisting God and they're running after the world. They're ashamed of the gospel. They don't want to stand for God. And Paul is saying to us this morning, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Amen. You are a Christian. Walk with God. Amen. Be bold in the things of God. Amen? Amen. Look at this. For, uh, be thou therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me. He's talking about his stuff that he goes through. Let me, let me tell you a, a practical application of verse 8. Nor of me as a prisoner. When I first got called to be the pastor, uh, I told the Lord no. And the reason why I told God no is because I was close to my pastor. When I got saved at the Fellowship Church, the, the Shield Church, there was 35 members. I did a lot of street ministry. I was close to the pastor. I used to drive his car to pick up kids from Sunday school. Matter of fact, we burnt the transmission out, driving it so much. I used to go to his house at night, 10 o'clock at night, and play checkers with them and chess. And, and I would say eat his food. But I would go in the refrigerator. There would be nothing in there but water and ice. He didn't have any food in the refrigerator. But yet he was given out to so many people just constantly doing ministry. And when, I, when the Lord called me to ministry, I was like, oh, no, I don't want to be poor. I didn't want to have that life that I saw my pastor having. I had just come from running a, 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 a advertising ministry business, brother. And we're doing $174,000 a year, making good money, driving nice cars, living in nice places. And then the Lord called me to the pastor. And the only thing I could see in my mind was that empty refrigerator. I was ashamed to want to be a pastor because I thought about the struggle that my pastor went through to build a dynamite, a dynamite uh, ministry that he has now. Then it was 35 members. Now he has 2,000 members in 1,000 churches worldwide, preaching all over the world, and Pakistan, and Africa, and China, all over the place. Places that most people don't even have churches. Because he was willing to not to be ashamed of the gospel. And to stand and do the work of God. And it's from that perspective God began to talk to me. I literally called him and said, I don't want to be a pastor. He's like, why is it good? I remember the refrigerator. You only had ice cubes and water. And he started busting up laughing. He said, Hudson, Hudson. I mean, I was like, oh, I was freaking out. I love God. I love doing ministry. But I didn't want to do that. He said, he said think. I've been traveling all over the world preaching the gospel to people. You've even been to Africa, and you baptized a bishop that had over 53 churches. It's like, hmm, yeah, I didn't think about that. He said, if you serve God, God will serve you. Amen. And I never forgot that, and I started the ministry. Amen. And I'm saying to you, don't be ashamed of being a, a servant of the Lord. Don't look at me or look at somebody else that's serving God, and they're having a hard time. And like, I don't want that. Yes, we have to be able to endure the afflictions. Yes. That's what it takes to build the kingdom. That's what it takes to serve the Lord. Yeah. So here it says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. The things that Jesus went through, the hardships that he went through, the beatings, the plucking the, uh, out of his face, taking his beard and plucking it out, smacking him in the face and stuff. Don't be ashamed of that. If Jesus suffered, you're going to suffer too. Yeah. That's part of ministry. That's part of walking with God. Yeah. He says, Be a partaker of the affliction of the gospel, who is saved as a call. Amen? Amen? Just know this. The world hates the Lord. Jesus said to the apostles, he said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. And the point that he's really saying is not that you experience outward hatred, not at this time yet, unless you say certain things. Yeah. Amen? But is that they're not in agreement with you. The world doesn't agree with us. I'm going to tell you right now, the world doesn't even agree with us from the church. The world doesn't agree with me saying the Lord will protect you from all, all sickness. Right. There are even saints that don't agree with me saying that. I'm like, really? <laughs> so why are we sending our missionaries in Africa right. and they have malaria yeah. and yellow fever and typhoid fever? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's because we're sending them. Yeah. Yeah. We're in that one. So it's very important that we understand that, listen, we have angels watching over us. And that's for real. That's not just, you know, some kind of spiritual talk. That's that's a real that's a real scenario that's taking place. Amen. 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 Praise God for the marshal.
That's a shoe. I've been seeing you in like what three years. He's from Detroit. He was visiting. So he's going to be at church today. We appreciate him. Amen. Let's go to chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two. As we're talking about walking with God and doing ministry. Very important. Chapter 2 is a favorite chapter of mine. I really love it. I'm going to look at verses 1 through 4. I'm not going to look at the whole chapter because these four verses are packed full of information. And if you have an opportunity, you should read 1st and 2nd Timothy. Uh, it's one of the books that I learned to read and how I started learning how to hear the voice of God. So our apostle said, read 1st and 2nd Timothy. So I read it. I came back and I read it. He said, okay, go back and read 1st and 2nd Timothy again. Went back and read it again. I came back, man, I read it. He said, okay, go back and read it. He did that six times. I was like, oh my God, why do you keep on reading the same old chapters? <laughs> but after that, when I would read it, the word would open up to me. I would see stuff. I was like, oh my God, I never saw that. Yes. How can you say you never saw that, but you read it six times? Because there's a revelation of the word yes. that you gain that's different than just having natural knowledge of the word. So if you ever want to kind of grow in the, the things of God, the revelation of the word of God, read and reread and reread certain things and it will open up to you. Amen? So this particular uh, chapter is a really good chapter. I like it. It says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It seems like a simple text. Be strong in the grace. But that word be strong in the grace means to be continually strengthened in the grace. So it's not like, I'm strong in the Lord. It's like there's an ongoing uh, process of being strengthened in God. And so when you look at the word grace, uh, many people will automatically say the word grace is God's divine favor. So be strong in God's divine favor. But it actually means more than that. It means more than just God's divine favor. When you look at the Hebrew word, the word grace, it means to, to have increased faith. So God's grace is God is what God gives you. Yes. And one of the things that God gives you is increased faith. See, you don't just have, you, your faith in Christ doesn't come from you. It comes from the Lord. Yes. This is why God's put you through tests. Because every time you go through a test and you come out on the other side, you become stronger yes. in God. Yes. Your faith is increased. Yes. And so we go from faith to faith and glory to glory. And so without going through trials and tribulations that God places in your way, you can never grow in the grace of God or grow in the, your faith in God. Yes. So God's grace is seen in your increased faith. Yes. It's also seen in your increased strength. You're not strong in your flesh. You can't resist the devil in your flesh. The only thing that allows us to stand firm in the things of God is the power of God operating through us. If it wasn't the Lord, we'd freak out every time. If you, as you start walking with God, you're going to be able to reflect back and say, man, I used to do it this way, you know, six months ago or a year ago. Man, I used to respond like that or I used to act like this. And what you are recognizing is that this is God that's bringing this continual change in your life. There's this increasing and increasing strength in your walk with God. And so Paul is talking to Timotheus. He says, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace. Continually grow in the graces of God. Another grace of God is increased knowledge. You think I just learned the word overnight? I've had people walk with God and they've been in the ministry three years or four years. And they say, well, I'm leaving because I'm not learning anything. I say, well, one, you don't come to Bible study. That's probably why you're not learning. You know, you don't come to Sunday school. You just come on Sunday. You can't learn everything. I say, well, you know, I know everything you know. I say, okay. Well, I've been studying the word for 30 years. You've been saved for four years. Of those four years, I really don't know how much you've been studying. Mm -hmm. You've been coming to church for four years. It's not possible for you to know what I know. Mm -hmm. Because there's an increased knowledge through continual study. You grow in the grace of God. One of the graces of God is God's knowledge. You can get head knowledge, but that's not God's knowledge. Paul says that we have received these revelations by the Spirit of the living God. I'm going to give you a small example. Satan knows the word, right? Right. He's been around for millions of years. Thousands of however long God created him. He knows the word better than most of us. But the Bible says that if he had known 
what's, what's going to happen when you put Jesus on the cross, he would have never put him on the cross. Right. But that doesn't make any sense. You had Isaiah was written. You had all kind of Old Testament scriptures that were written about what God was going to do. What was going on? The prophets were looking into it, and they couldn't see even what they, only, what they wrote themselves. Satan couldn't see it because it was written knowledge, but he did not have God's knowledge. He did not have revelation. And so when Paul comes along, Paul knew Isaiah. He was brought up in the, in the Old Testament scrolls. He was brought up in the, the top schools. He still didn't understand Isaiah. But then God came along, knocked him off the horse on the road to Damascus, gives him the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, and begins to give him revelation on the word of God. And this is what God gives us. That's called the graces of God when God gives you insight to what the word is really all about. And so Paul tells Timotheus to grow in the graces. One of those graces is you have to grow in the knowledge of God. That means you've got to spend time praying. I used to pray all the time, Lord, give me wisdom, give me understanding. Yes, yes. And even when I preach, I'm like, God, help me to make it clear. Help me to teach the word in a way that people will understand it. Because you can teach head knowledge, you can tell jokes and all kinds of stuff. People can laugh and they never learn anything more in the word of God. Learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. We need to have a deep understanding of the word of God that comes from God himself. Amen. Amen. That's called the grace of God. It's not just God's divine favor. It means more than that. It means God giving you when he doesn't have to give you knowledge. James says, if any man lack wisdom, let him do what? Study a book. Get somebody else that's writing a book. All these people writing books is all surface stuff. We read so many books that we still don't have an understanding of the word. Yes. He says, if any man lack wisdom, let him do what? Let him ask of God who give it to every man. Uh, upgraded now. What is he talking about upgraded now? Meaning that he won't rebuke you for a question. He never says, oh, that's a stupid question. Well, you should already know that by now. Jesus never does that. When you do not understand something in the word of God, when you go before God and ask the Lord, show me, give me insight, God will begin to uncover yes. Yes. and reveal to you what the word really means. Yes. That's why it's very challenging when you're arguing with people on the streets that don't really know the Bible, they just have scriptures memorized. And they're throwing out scriptures and they're using scriptures completely out of context. Completely out of context of what the scripture actually means according to the will of God, not according to man's head knowledge. And so as you begin to walk with God, as you continue to do ministry, yes. it's important that you pray that God will give you grace. God, give me grace. Give me insight. Give me understanding. It will only come when you ask God for it. I can't force it into your head. You will not receive it by osmosis. I don't care. I can preach hard. I can do jumping jacks. I can do backflips. But you have to have a desire for the things of God. Yes. And that desire comes from God. Yes. That's called the grace of God. You guys with me this morning? Amen. Amen. Now, therefore, my son, be strong. In the grace, one of the other graces is your affection. What are you talking about, preacher? And affection is the way you feel about God. This is a, a subtle attack of the enemy that he does with us. He'll make you not want to. I don't feel like it. I don't feel like reading the Bible. I feel like going to church. I feel like praying. And we, we think that's okay because it's like a natural thing to feel when you don't feel like doing something. Somebody call you up, you don't feel like talking to them. <laughs> and so we do kind of the same thing with the Lord. So though that affection, the way you feel for God, is a grace of God. That God gives you a desire for the things of God. That's a one. I'm so glad. And this is why Paul uh, David said, uh, don't take thy Holy Spirit from me. What, he, what was he really saying? Don't take the way I feel towards you away from me. I would hate to walk in sin and live in sin and not feel nothing. Yeah. Not feel convicted. Not feel like I did something wrong, but everything's okay. Because then I'm, I'm missing out on being able to be corrected. I'm missing out on being able to have the kind of right standing in God. But 
I'm so grateful, and I, I hope that you are grateful, that the way that you feel toward God, you need to understand, that is God that gives you that affection. Look at this in Psalms 37. Just keep your place here. I just want to show you a, a verse here. Psalms 37. Psalm 37, verse 4. Very powerful text. 22 lines was a very powerful text. It deals with having affection. Yes. The writer here says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. Now here's what happens. People want to get the desires of their heart, but they don't want to love Jesus. Right. Oh Lord, give me this, give me that. You know, you know I've been wanting this all my life. Hear that all the time. Oh. I've been wanting this for a long time. Yeah, but you're not delighting yourself in the Lord. You just want God to do something for you, but you don't want to love him. That's like being in a bad relationship. Yeah. <laughs> you want me to cook all the time, but you don't want to tell me you love me. You want me to bring money home all the time and give to you, but you don't want to show me that you care. And the Lord says, listen, I'll give you the desires of your heart, but that's second. That's not first. Delight yourself in me. Desire me. Love me. Show me that you care. Put me first. Yeah. I'll give you all that other stuff. You don't even have to worry about it. Yeah. That's the point you're trying to make. That's not that you have to be constantly telling God, Lord, you know what I want. Lord, the Lord says, listen, I already know what you have need of. I already know what you want. How is he able to give us the desires of our heart? Because the Lord knows everything that we desire. He knows the thoughts that we think. Yeah. And all he's saying is, listen, just love me. If you just love me, I'll take care of you. Yeah. And when we're walking with God, this is the graces of God. We're strong in the graces of God. We're strong in our affection toward the Lord. We let people know, I love Jesus. Yeah. Amen. That's why it ties in with the first chapter. He says not, not to be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of telling people that you love the Lord. Right. I was talking to the, to the brothers this morning. Let's go back to 2 Timothy. About the t-shirts. In the county. And one teacher says, Great is the Lord. And I thought, I should have really pushed that t shirt. Every time I wear that t shirt, oh, she got it on over there. Great is the Lord. Someone says to me, Yeah, I like that t shirt. Yeah, 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 yeah man. Yeah, sure the minister told me he was wearing the t shirt at the store one time. And he walked out the store. The guy ran out the store, almost got hit by a car, <laughs> just to run up to him and go, Yes. <laughs> Great is the Lord. Amen. Having a desire to let people know, I love God. Yeah. And that being a shame. Yeah. Yeah. Go back to 2 Timothy. Look at this. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Thou, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace. Everybody understand how broad that word grace is now? Yeah. It's not just some small being kind. Yeah. It's overarching. Yeah. It causes you to exercise Christian virtue. Being strong in the grace is being able to walk in Christian virtue. Boy, man, that's such a, a fancy word, Christian virtue. Uh, what are you talking about, preacher? Or can you just bring it down to common language? Christian virtue means to live uh, a high moral standard. Yeah. When you're strong, strong in the grace of God, you are able to say, no, I'm not doing that. That's sin. Yeah. When I got saved, I lived with my girlfriend. Matter of fact, we have bought a house together, a four-bedroom house. Paid $53,000, brand new. When I got delivered from drugs and everything and got saved, I moved out the house and moved into the men's home. But what was going on? I had made a decision that I wanted to change my moral standards. Yeah. When you walk with God, you change your behavior. Yes. Yes, you when you recognize that God is the one that's giving you the desire to love him. Yeah. God is the one that gives you the strength to say no. Yeah. And then you do. But the church, we are to be strong in the grace of God, which means God gives us the strength to have a higher moral standard. It takes God to do that because it's easy just to get down there with them. Yeah. You're like, that's what you want to do. That's your thing. It don't bother me. It should bother you. Yeah. Right. You should not feel good about it. I'm not saying that we're perfect. I'm saying our desire changes. 
And the longer you walk with God, the more victory you have over these areas and the more your standard rises. See, we're talking about walking with God and doing ministry. Because God has definitely called us for such a time as this. Yes. And if I beat around the bush on these things, you'll never be able to walk the way God wants you to walk. Right. And when I talk about these things, I know sometimes it makes people uncomfortable. Sometimes people even get mad at me. I don't even care if people get mad at me. It's no big thing. Yeah. I've been a salesman for 30 years. You're a salesman, everybody gets mad at you. Yeah. Hey, we know you're not. Get out of here! Okay! <laughs> <laughs> Go to the next door. You get accustomed to it. So anger is just a form of manipulation. That's all it is. Right. People get mad because they want you to stop. Mm -hmm. Don't say that. No, you can't tell me what not to say. Your anger is not going to stop. And so we have to preach the gospel so it helps people. That's why Paul is instructing Timotheus. He's getting ready to be the bishop over the largest church of his time, the church of Ephesus. And he's young. He's a young guy. He's in his 30s. And you got men that are much older than young. And he's telling him, listen, you got to be strong in the grace of God. Because they'll run over you. Right. They'll tell you, no, nah, man, you shouldn't be saying that. You got to be, listen, you, you don't tell me what to say. The Lord tells me what to Amen. say. You have to be able to have a stance. Yeah. Look at this. Chapter 2. I told you I'm going to teach today. Yeah. Paul goes on and says, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses... The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. There's two thoughts here in this text. The first thought is found in verse 3. And the thought is, no, verse 2 rather, the thought is that you're to commit the wisdom and the insight to people that want to deceive. Sometimes you can be hitting your head against the wall because you're trying to convince somebody who don't want to be convinced. Right. That's why Jesus told the apostles, he said, go into the city, heal the sick, preach the gospel, heal the sick, you know, but if somebody doesn't want to receive you, don't sit there and get mad with them, fussing and stuff. Just say, okay, and go on to somebody else. There is somebody that wants to receive the gospel. Yeah. And he's telling to both of us, he said, you need to spend your time imparting wisdom into people, one that are faithful to God, and that want to receive the word of God. Yes. So we spend our time worrying about who's not coming to church versus who is coming to church. So you're overlooking people that want something, right. running after somebody that don't want it. Yeah. It's like delicate balance versus loving somebody to Christ Versus wasting your time, which is a trick of the enemy, when you could be feeding the flock of God, yes. the people that really want something from God, so they can grow in the things of God. Yes. Because those are the ones that are going to carry the mantle on into the next generation. Amen. Are you with me? That's, that's very hard. Yes. Sometimes you're like, you're just hard, you just don't care. I care, but I care about what God says. Right. And this becomes a place of maturity. Where you begin to, as you walk with God, ask God, what is it that you want from me? What do you want me to do? How am I supposed to behave? Who am I supposed to minister to? Who should I spend time with? Now, I knew people that are coming in. Of course, they're going to spend time with me. They're alone. But there are people that you've been trying to get to do things yeah. for 10 years, and you're still trying to, you got to leave them alone. Amen. Because there are people that actually want something. Yeah. They want to serve God. They want to walk with God. And you've got to pour into them you got to commit these things into them so they have the wisdom and the insight to be able to carry it to the next generation so they'll be able to teach somebody else. So my job when I'm teaching you is I want to do the best I can so that you grasp it in a way that you can turn around and reteach. If you've been in the ministry for any amount of time, whether it's, you know, three years, four years, six years, I should be able to stop right now and call you up and help you express one of these scriptures. Don't get scared all of a sudden. <laughs> Don't call me. I just woke up. My mind ain't working right now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But in reality, most of you that are sitting here could. You could literally just get up and you could read it and you could express 
at whatever level you're at, but you know about that scripture to be true. Right. And if I'm doing a really good job, you can go from verse to verse to verse, and God will just be speaking to you while you're teaching, and you've been able to teach the word. That's what Paul is saying to Timotheus. He said, take time with people that are committed to God and deliver to them what, I, what, you've been, what I've delivered to you so they can in turn deliver it to somebody else. So I was an excellent student of the Apostle Alexander. I used to take notes. I always had a notebook and pen. I always sat on the edge of my seat and I took notes and things like that. I had boxes of notes. That's how I learned because I wanted to learn. That's why I'm able to teach the word to the next generation. That's why Minister Ricky can teach the word the way he teaches the word. Why? Because he, he studies the word. He takes notes. He calls me. He asks questions. He reads the word. Why? Because when I'm teaching him, he's now in turn teaching others. And that's how everyone should be. We are a full body ministry. You should not just be coming here just to get your head full, have a fat head, and then go on about your business, and you don't ever teach nobody else. You should be able to absorb information and look at it and read it and then turn around and say, listen, let me show you an angle on this text. Yeah. Yep. I've had Minister Richie call me and say, Bishop, let me show you something the Lord showed me. On scriptures that I've been reading and teaching. Yeah. I'd be like, oh man, I never saw it that way. Yeah. Because that's what happens when you take what you're learning and then God adds to that. Because yeah. no man knows everything. Yeah. We all know something. Amen? 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look where we are. Verse 2. Look at verse 3. It says, that, uh, Commit to thou the faithful men, verse 2, shall be able to teach us also. Thou, therefore, you are to endure hardness as a good soldier. This is very important. We must continue to endure evil. Uh, it's not going to just happen one time and dissipate. Right. It's going to be this ongoing onslaught of the enemy who's constantly, seems like he's just bombarding us with stuff left and right. And so we have to understand that that's part of walking with God. It's definitely part of being in ministry. You just have to endure it. You have to put up with it. You got to go through it. And on and on and on until the I know sometimes we're thinking, oh, when am I going to get some relief? You know, Lord Jesus, I don't know when you're going to get some relief. I can't answer that question. I'm asking the same question myself. Oh, Jesus, this is getting on my nerves. And the Lord's like, really? I'm like, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> but sometimes these, these struggles in, in, in doing the work of ministry can make you feel uh, like you want to give up or impatient. Why is that happening? Because you're expecting things to go the way you want them to go. And when things don't go your way, we have this tendency of saying, okay, forget it then. But God is, uh, Paul is telling Timotheus, that's going to happen to you. You're building the work, and there are going to be times when you want them to say, forget it. He says, you've got to continue. Someone say, continue. continue. You've got to continue to endure. We cannot allow our hearts to be uh, so divided between the work of God and living a life of ease. This is the ongoing challenge. Uh, when, see, so what happens is you come, you have this terrible life, this pressure life, uh, everything's going wrong. You know, Jesus saved me. And then you get saved. And then over the course of time, your life just gets easy. You have no pressure. You ain't getting high, you ain't getting drunk. Your finances are good, you got money saved. And your life becomes like a life of ease. And, it's, and it happens so subtly. You, you look back and you think, wow, that coronavirus, okay, we all got everything. Yeah. Send out 200 texts to everybody. Okay, Pastor, you have yeah. whatever you need. You need us to bring you something? I'm like, you know, I get more of everything. It's like you start living this life of ease. And you have to be careful with that because you don't want to have your heart so divided on living a life of ease that you're not willing to endure any affliction. Because when you do ministry, when you want to give out and pour out to people, then the affliction comes. Because people call you at the worst time. You're right in the middle of cooking. Food smells good. Five minutes away. Table set, phone rang. Uh. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> what a dilemma. Yeah. You answer the phone, they need your help, they need you to run across town. Yeah. But I just was getting ready to fix the thing. <laughs> Time I get back, the food's gonna be cold. 
know I hate cold food. Well, let's do that one. You can't let your heart get so connected to a life of ease that you serve God out of convenience. That you only serve God when it's a, a good time for you. When, when you're able right now and it's not going to inconvenience you. So the way that you, you have to be able to endure hardness, you have to be able to endure the times when you don't want to do it. That's when you have to do it. When you don't want to pray, God gets on you to pray. God wakes you up at 2 in the morning and says pray. you got to wake up and pray. you got to do the things that God is calling you to do, even when it's not convenient. Whether it's giving up your money, giving up your time, whatever the case might be. That's what it means to walk with God and to do ministry. Yes, we're blessed. But don't let your blessing be a curse. Amen. Don't let the good times roll all the time. Yeah. Let the good times roll. Yeah. Yeah. That's old school. You know? yeah, that's the only time. <laughs> See this? Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier. The divided heart will open you up to always being tempted to avoid doing the things that God has called you to do. It will. So always uh, keep your heart focused on the things that the grace of God, the desire, the affections that come from the grace of God. It's God that gives us those affections to serve Him, not us. Amen. God starts giving you desire, so embrace it. Yes. Flow with it. You already know it's going to cost us. But do it anyway. Yes, yes. Enjoy it. Yes. This is what it means to walk with God. No man, verse 4, that entangles himself in the affairs of his life, nor be able to please him as he chose him to be a soldier. Amen? Chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3. These things are what God is calling us to to walk with, with the mindset that says, Thy will be done. Yes, come on. Come on. What is it, Lord, that you would have me to do? Yes. Sometimes you can complain about everything that you're doing and that nobody else is doing nothing, and then you end up being like Elijah. Only I, only. Right. I'm the only prophet doing stuff. And God says, Hold up, let me stop you right here because you got all this. I got 700 prophets that have not bowed the knee to bell. I have, I have people everywhere that are serving me that you don't even know about. We have to understand, there are a lot of people that have a commitment to God. They have an affinity for the things of God. And so just because one person doesn't want to do it, listen, there's always somebody that wants to do it. The Lord says, I will have a remnant. I will have people that love me and will serve me. I'm just asking you to be one of them. And if you don't be one of them, you're not going to stop anything. No man can stop the ship. God says, I will build the church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. What is the gates of hell? It is that spirit that resists what God wants to get accomplished. He said, there is no demonic spirit that can resist what God is doing. None, not one. Even though you might look around you, and it looks like, my God, it's such a resistance to the church. It ain't going to stop the Lord. Yeah. It'll, be, it'll be like, the, what's his name? Neil. <laughs> well, I forgot the name of the movie. But Matrix, he's all down. And all the guys are all piled on him. And he goes, Pah! And he shoots up. And they fly everywhere. It's like evil will try to stop the church. Right. It'll be all around, just piling up and piling up. And then the Lord all of a sudden be like, okay, I'm done with that. Fire! Churches pops up. Yes, I'm trying to give you some vision. <laughs> this is just the way I see things. I'm weird that way. We're going to test it. Amen. We're looking at four chapters. We're just looking at a few verses that leads us to chapter four. Chapter 3, verse 1, a very familiar text. You know also that in the last days, perilous times will come. You've heard this spoken about quite often down through the years. And I 
want to bring it back to mind because the word careless means there are times that are hard to bear. Yes. Right now, it's kind of hard to bear for people just to stay at home. Right. They're, they're so used and accustomed to, you know, going and coming and, and that freedom that when it gets stifled, it just becomes difficult. For me, especially because I really don't like this to stay. I like to go around and just for no reason. Other people have to have a reason to go somewhere. I don't need a reason. I'm just like, where are you going? I'm just going. <laughs> like, okay, so you get back. <laughs> Go around the circle. And after a few periods of time, I'm going to the store. We don't need anything. Right. Like, okay. I'm just going to see if there's something there. <laughs> you know, I don't want to stay. I want. To, I like to go. I hate taking people to the airport because I want to get on the plane. Right. Like, oh my God, I wish I could go with you. Just, I like flying. I like travel. I like, you know. And so you're. Perilous times are going to be things that are going to be hard to bear. That might seem like a simple thing, but in many areas of our life, uh, as times get worse and worse and harder and harder, some things are going to be hard to bear. Yes. You know, a family member loses a job, now they got to come stay with you. Yes. You're all stacked up in the house with four of y'all. Mm -hmm. Remember that one time we had a two-bedroom apartment, we had like 12 people in with us? One guy's feet was all swollen up. He was laying on the couch, his feet all on the edge of the couch. My wife would like take care of his feet every night and it was all blistery yeah. and stuff and put a towel on the edge of the couch so we wouldn't get on the couch. People sleeping all on the floor and stuff. That's ministry. That's when, that's old school ministry. We were doing that ministry when we first started. Yes. Thank God the Lord moved us. Those were the times. Those were about twenty two years we've had fifty four different people live with us. All kinds of people we met on the streets and helped them different kinds of things. Sometimes, uh, perilous times in your times are hard to bear. Yes. You wake up and you're stepping over people. Yeah. Uh, do I really want to do this? Yeah. Uh, things are hard to bear. The word perilous also means troublesome or annoyance. Mm -hmm. When you do ministry, you're walking with God, people can annoy you. Yes. That's yes. just the way it is. Things can annoy you. Yes, yeah. uh, so yeah. if you're enduring hardness if you're, as a good soldier, and then you understand that there are perilous times, there's going to be annoying times. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. You know, uh, I, I, don't, I hate to be the bearer of bad news today, but I just I have to deliver this to you so that you will feel like somehow you're doing something wrong in God. You're not doing anything wrong when you feel annoyed about things. This is just what happens. When situations get tough, you can feel annoyed about them because you want things to be a certain way, and when they're not, you can be annoyed. And this is, I want you to understand, it's really clear. As we move closer to closer to the end times, it's going to get harder and harder, and you become more and more annoyed. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Because you're going to remember the former days. Yes. You're yes. looking yes. back at yes. you know, yes. it. Yes. Yeah, it was much better when you wouldn't say all this kind of stuff. Yes. You've got to ignore that stuff. Yeah. See this? Perilous times. Yes. Dangerous. The word perilous means dangerous and harsh. Mm -hmm. Fierce. Powerful and destructive. We're at times where uh, hurricanes are just wiping out stuff. Yeah. That's how you know it's a perilous time. It's, it's a very fierce time, very savage time. That's the word perilous. You see, the word perilous has all these definitions. The word savage, you know, is violent and uncontrolled. I was thinking about those guys that was beating up their girl and stopping her, kicking her in the video that went viral. It's so miserable just to look at that hurt in my heart. How can you be that violent? age, right, right. 16, 17 years old, 15 years old, taking a woman that's in a teenager, and kicking her, and stomping her, and beating her, and taking off her shoes, and stealing her purse. This is the time that we're living. We're living in perilous times. Yes. Don't walk out of your car, walk into the store, looking at your phone. Right, right. Pay attention. Amen. Understand, you live in perilous times. Somebody will snatch your purse, knock you in the head because you ain't paying attention. You're right. Right. Yep. Yep. Don't do that. That's how the world does. We're not in the world. We're not of the world. We're in it. Yeah. Understand, we're living in this word. It's a very powerful Thank word. God. And when you read this text, or I preach this text, you can read over it so fast that it doesn't have the real meaning. Just know also that in the last days, we are in the last days right now. Right. Perilous times shall come. Savage times, dangerous times, fierce times. My Lord. 
You guys with me today? Amen. Walking with God. We're men and women of God. We're Christians. Yes. Doing ministry. Yes. Whether that ministry is prayer, writing a blog, doing a video, preaching the gospel, witnessing the people. We're doing ministry. We're men and women of God. We're in perilous times. We need to understand what's going on around us. There are people that are trying to do stuff to you. Yes. But thank God for Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus self shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you are to continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. He says, listen, you need to understand it's perilous times. Yes, men are going to get worse and worse. Evil men are going to wax worse and worse, seducing people. People are going to be getting tricked left and right. But you are to continue the things of God. Yes. Don't get caught up. Stand back and just look at what's going on around you. Say, okay, I see that. And you ain't going to get me over there. Oh, I see that trap. You ain't going to get me there. And just pay attention to what people are saying to you. Things that are coming in your ear gates, things that are coming to your eye gate. You are to filter those things. You are to grab, grab, grab every thought and bring it into captivity because the enemy will try to torment your mind. When they brought, when that spirit of fear was released into the nation, right. I right away grabbed it. I said, this is the spirit of fear. Say, I love you. We Amen. have angels all Amen. around us. Amen. The word of God says very clearly that no evil shall come near me. Yep. No sickness or disease. I start speaking the word of God. Yes. And I understood that was a trick of the enemy. Yes. You should be doing the same thing. Right. Even up to this day. Yes. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. They're going to be deceiving everybody they can. They're going to even be deceiving themselves. Yeah. 